Once again, guys, um, this is Dr. Prince's show, and uh, we have a very special guest. He's the one and only, lovable, one of our favorite comedians, Russell Howard. Oh, thanks for having me, mate. Uh, it's so good to have you, man. And I think it's appropriate to just let everyone know how my relationship with you started out. Yeah. Um, just, obviously, you didn't know that I was following you. I was one of your, you know, fans. Yeah. Uh, I used to watch you on that, that show. Was it The Good, good News? Yeah, right. Uh, that comedy show. And I loved it. I thought, this guy is different, man. And I loved the way you kind of got onto real issues that were going on and put a spin on it. Yeah. And uh, your, just your outlook on life. Uh, I thought that was really refreshing. For I love this comedian. Um, and to have an email saying that you wanted me to come on to your, your show that was coming on, I was really excited about that. Um, because obviously the issue was something that I'm really passionate about, young people's lives. Mm. And just to be able to sit down with you. And I thought that was kind of different because comedians, knife crime, you know, you don't normally see the two kind of go together. Yeah. So to come on your show um, and just have a, that nice sort of relaxed setting and sit with you, but actually really discuss the seriousness of that. So anyone that's watching that hasn't seen that show that's come on, please check it out. But it was, what was amazing from my point of view is yeah. because it's, it's an issue that everyone, like when you read about knife crime mm. in this country, yeah. it's harrowing. And then to find you in the middle of this kind of story and everything you've been through and the, but what struck me about you was the resilience and the desire that you had to make things better. And I think we live in a world where, where not everyone is that way, mm. but you were so determined. And it, it, I just remember the audience, you gave everyone the chills because what you've been through was so heartbreaking mm. and you had every reason to be furious, but you were, you'd sort of taken that energy somehow and you were, you were using it to try and ensure that it never happens again. And it was just amazing. And, and it, it sort of transcends entertainment or comedy mm. where somebody is willing to, to explain their point of view and everyone got it, irrespective of your kind of social background, yeah. your gender, whatever. It was yeah. just like, here's a dad who's had something brutal happen, who is trying desperately to make sure that this doesn't happen again or happens less and less and less. It was incredible. I was going to ask you, why did you invite me on the show? And I don't, I don't need to now, because you kind of just broke that down for me. So yeah. now I, I get it myself. I know that, you know, we sat and we had a good talk, but I just thought it was real and genuine. Yeah. And there was that really nice rapport there as well. Yeah. Um, and to see you not just do it for the show, because you know, a lot of people just do it. There was more to you than that, Russell. Well, but how could there not be? When you meet somebody, it's sort of that interesting thing. When you meet someone that isn't fake, we all do, irrespective of whether you're in entertainment or whatever. Yeah. Like weirdly, I met these, these ladies in New Zealand um, who, who made coffins. It turns out coffins are really expensive. I didn't know this. Mm -hmm. So they're retired old ladies in New Zealand that make cheap coffins for people. Brilliant. They just do it. And I went into this room and there was a room full of coffins for babies. And it's one of those things you can't unsee. Like we're talking tiny, wow. tiny, the most, the saddest things I've ever seen. Don't like, I know it. Exactly, man. And I met this lady mm. and I said, how do you, how do you make that? How, how do you put yourself in that space? And she kind of looked at me and I do it so no one else has to. And something like that just gives you the chills because mm. it reminds you that, that there is sadness mm. in the world and there's people who are trying to make the darkness a little bit less yes. so and illuminate it. And it's, yeah. it's, it's those kind of things. It was a similar conversation with you where mm. you meet people and it, you don't have to worry about being funny yeah. or being entertaining mm. because our conversation is a conversation that I wanted to have and you yeah. wanted to have. So the audience, they can't help but be, be there with us. That's it. Because we were, having a, we were having the kind of chat that we would have had if we met in a pub. There you go. And I had that kind of conversation. I was like, oh shit. Like, you know, it was that kind of thing. It wasn't like, okay, we've got to do 20 minutes and then we'll do a smile for the camera 
Yes. And then, right, okay, now we'll both fuck off. You know, it was it was a genuine conversation, man. I love the energy from the crowd as well. Oh, it's incredible. And you look, because, well, this is the thing, but you, like, uh, like you were sort of telling me, oh, you haven't sort of performed in front. There's like 500 people there. Mm. They, they were like sort of putty in your hand. It yeah. was incredible. Yeah, I just, I just love the energy. I think it was based on just how we just created that nice report. I don't think it was talks. us, man. I think it was you. I think it's that thing that, that, that there is something so captivating about authenticity. Okay. And it's like you, when you talk about uh, being a mentor for, for kind of young kids that are, that are in a really precarious situation, mm. the, the, the something about meeting you instantly and looking in your eyes, that they, there's, there's this weird duende where you're like, this guy, this guy's for real. And it, mm. so instantly you're willing to kind of go, okay, let's, let's discuss this. Do you know so, what I mean? I totally get it, but I'm still like, I've met so much people over the years, mm. I've been on this, it'd be nice to say 15 years since, since uh, my son passed till now, but I was on this long before uh, my son died. A lot of people don't realize my career ended and I started doing youth work because I wanted to give back to young people because I realized I had something special. Yeah. I was a kid on the streets, homeless, gone for all of that, drugs, crime. Then I changed from that into becoming number one in the world as a light heavyweight champion. So I wanted to use that and share with the young people to try and prevent what I was seeing kind of increase slowly. It was nothing like it was after my son died because it just got, got worse and worse. Mm. But in 2001 and two, he was hearing, you know, this kid over here, that kid's like, no, nah, let me use some of that. So I trained myself, done all the training, got the, you know, passed my exams and started doing the work. And so I'd been doing this before my son died. In fact, Kyan, I used to bring him with me so he could train, he could be a part of the projects that I was running and he could see how fortunate he was because a lot of the young guys there did not have a father figure, didn't have someone pushing them. And Kyan had a dad that could kind of show off in a way, you know, sign things for, for him and take to his, his mates, you know, gloves, whatever they wanted. And somebody who'd succeeded from just being on the streets and coming from no, nothing, really. Mm, mm. So him coming to the projects was a big deal. Mm. And he never showed off about being signed with QPR. You know, people didn't come in, oh, there's Kyan, he's there, because he just came in as one of the kids. Yeah. So I loved bringing him in. And I always used to pick on him and make him do hard training and say, that nah, kid over there, give me 20 more and stuff like that. But he'd just do it. He would just get on with it. So it was a beautiful thing. So I was just sharing that to, to let people understand a bit more of this, because a lot of people don't understand this, that I've been passionate about young people's lives and felt that I had something to give back. Yeah. From 2001, I had my injury from my leg in 2000, and then in, in 2001 <clears throat> and two, I started training to do this work. But my real question that baffled me about you was your passion to do more than just bring me on the show. <clears throat> You then had an idea to bring me in the concert. Yeah. And, and to just try and raise some funds. Well, it's the weird thing with, with comedy. It's basically the easiest way of making m money from like, like a benefit gig. Yeah. So we were talking beforehand about trying to find a premises yeah, yeah. for what you do. So if you had like a, a boxing gym that also had kind of the various rooms yeah, where see. you could have counseling, mentoring, whatever it mm. is. The great thing about a stand-up night is you can do the... Uh, you could do the Apollo, you could do the O2, mm. you could do wherever. And it's easy kind of money because everyone has a laugh, you know. Yeah, they're in a good mood. Then the money goes in, yep. then, you know, the charity takes the money. Mm. So it's kind of, yeah, it's sort of a no-brainer, really. It was awesome. But, but it's also that thing of, like, you know, every so often it's, it's so important in life, isn't it, to walk in someone else's shoes. Yeah. And... I could sort of recognise when it, you meet certain people and you kind of you want to you want to help them in in whatever way you can and if mm. you're lucky enough to to be able to do a gig, mm. it, it's no problem if you kind of go okay we'll put on this thing or we'll do this thing. Do you, you know might, what I mean? You might you might you might say that, but I just need everyone to understand the kind of person that uses his platform to help somebody else on their platform. And that's big because on my journey, a lot of people think that's 
oh yeah, you know, you're with these people, they'll do that and that for you, you'll be all right. Mm. But it's been a grind. It's been hard work because I don't have any fear against anyone and I've no expectations. So I don't go into a relationship thinking, yeah, you should do this for me or, or anything. Mm. I just know what I need to do. If you feel in your heart that you want to do something, that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. But I often think, honestly, mate, I think, see, I think what you're talking to kind of, you're mentoring young kids. Yeah. I, I genuinely believe that you could do a sort of a comedy course with those kids as well as a boxing course or something Love like that. It. But, but it's the truth because yeah. they will have stories yeah. that are so funny mm -hmm. and wild they have. And, and it will be cathartic. Yeah. And to, like genuinely, that is a really important because you're also, you're, you're, you're letting them know that they already have a skill. There'll be one of the kids that you've met yeah. who is potentially the next great. There's another Russell Howard. Mate, but beyond, there's, a, there's yeah. an English Richard Pryor, there's yeah. an English uh, Chris yeah. Rock, Chappelle. Yeah. Um, Michelle Wolf, whoever it Brilliant. may be, yeah. because because they can, and uh, I don't know. I just think it's really. If you come from a certain background, th the very idea that you could do stuff, be a boxing champion, be a mm -hmm. footballer, mm -hmm. be a comedian, yeah. it's, it's insane. It's it's, incredible, it's, these it? things don't happen. Yeah, but but they sometimes do if you meet the right person mm -hmm. that that just sparks something, Brilliant. and and it's about the spark, isn't it? And Brilliant. and but particularly the kids that you're dealing with, yeah. like the pressure they're under is insane. Yeah. Can you imagine that? It's like, like I had a joke in, in my special where I was talking about knife crime, talking yeah. about kids who are nine ca carrying knives. Mm. And the point I was making is that, that imagine being nine years old. Like that's not a criminal, that's a scared boy. That's it. And when I was nine, that's me and my it. brother, genuinely, we used to sellotape our assholes <laughs> to see if we could fire out of our mouth. And the point I was making yeah. is you don't realise how yeah. lucky you are yeah. that you could that you could do that. Okay. But that's what a nine-year-old sort of should be doing, mm -hmm, but maybe mm -hmm. shouldn't. But being a being a stupid kid yeah. versus these these nine-year-olds that are having to carry a grown man's fucking burden. Yeah. And and yeah. so the way I can articulate that is through a joke. That's it. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. it's kind of. But and the point I'm making, these kids have untold stories and anecdotes and viewpoints that, and they can um, express their stories mm -hmm. that, that, that can genuinely change the way people think. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's true, man. And, it's and look how many young kids don't realize that they could turn their natural ability into being a comedian. Fuck yeah, and they can turn their sadness into something hilarious and cathartic there and they can, but they can mock, Powerful. but they can mock all their pain. Love it. And laugh it away. Mm. And not everyone can, but wow. some people, if, if that's the way you are, yeah, yeah. it's like, you, but you look at someone like Richard Pryor, like, you know. Classic, but, definitely. But, but, you know, sort Switched of. Switched it up, didn't But he? raised, raised by his grandmother. Yeah. And in a, I'm pretty sure he was raised in kind of a brothel. Yeah. You know, like surrounded by drugs and that's whatnot. Right. And was able to, turn this into a mirror for America to look at. And he, you know, and you could genuinely lay a claim that Richard Pryor helped with race relations in America because he was yeah, so straight. fucking funny yeah. that you couldn't deny, you just kind of go, wow, he's an exceptionally, I, I would like to meet more That's people right. like him. And it, you sort of break down barriers, yeah. man. And it weren't about It wasn't about doing anymore. it, you know, it was yeah. totally, it was just like, that guy's fucking He's just funny. Yeah. Regardless of where he's from. Exactly. Funny. Funny is just funny and everybody wants to laugh. Yeah, exactly. Everyone loves a comedian. So where Not does... everyone. I mean, the papers are pretty, uh, pretty dicey. But yeah, most, most people. But yeah, The Independent and The Guardian, not so keen. But people like to laugh. So how, can, how, how do you think we can... Because school obviously doesn't do it. That's a different sort of system. How do, we, how do we kind of create that and see something in young people? Like my wife's boy, you know, obviously my stepson, D'Angelo, he's, he's quite naturally funny. My brother is just hilarious growing mm. up. He used to go in the closet, you know, put on an old, blank, old blanket, like a Clint Eastwood outfit and yeah. come out 
and you know do Clint Eastwood, and we'd just be um, we'd just be just bussing up, yeah. cracking my brother. He was brilliant, yeah. And but if you live now, yeah, he is alive. But if he was about as a kid now, yeah, he'd have his own Instagram account, yeah, and he'd let loads of people watching what he's doing. Mm. So it's like Mo Gilligan. That's how we kind of started, yeah, true, yeah. just on Insta, yeah. So. Do you think that we can encourage kids with whatever talent they've got through schooling as well? And it shouldn't be just the serious stuff. It should be your creative ability as well. Imagine a school that where it wasn't just a creative art school. Yeah. It was that we've seen that you have this gift at school and we have a platform for you to develop that. Yeah, I think that... See, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because like education is vital and kids get turned on in different ways. Like, yeah. I was never really into kind of like maths or science because I couldn't, I couldn't follow through the sort of tangibility of it. But the... But then you do good. You, you went uni and got... A, yeah, I went to university. But the, but the point is it's sort of like, I, I, I don't know. I all, my thing was always a bit of a secret. So I would write jokes kind of from like 15. and okay. I would not really tell anyone about it, but it was kind of like this embarrassing thing because I think that's also quite a big thing to get over in, in, in Britain like your brother's hilarious right but then if your brother um, had or your, your stepson mm. if they had the audacity to say I'm going to be a comedian we sort of have this culture in, in Britain where it's like oh fucking funny it's like mate you've laughed at me my whole life yeah. but all of a sudden well, now now it's I like, want to be a comedian yeah. officially funny it's right so you have yeah. to sort of do it in, in, in quiet but I think things like Instagram, it's a good point where you can do it yourself. Yeah. But I think, like you say, with school, it, it, it's, or like, is it, is it like other classes? Is it kind of, uh, is it people like you coming in? Is, mm. it, is it people who've been to that school before coming back? Like, that's the thing that doesn't really happen. It certainly didn't happen at my school, yeah. where you'd have successful people in, in a range of stuff come back. But, but it's really, I think that's a big thing because you then, you're able to kind of go, oh wow, she was at the same school as me. She used to sit on that same wall and wait for her mum to pick her up or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, I think, I think hearing successful people's stories, whether they're doctors or mm, lawyers mm -hmm. or engineers mm -hmm. or yeah, yeah. Firefighters or footballers or comedians or whatever it may be, because like anyone that that can help, I don't know, sort of show a pathway for you if you're in a tricky situation. Yeah. You sort of hold on to that, I think. Yeah. You or you see somebody and they, particularly when you're young. And, or you have an idol, mm. or, uh, so that idol becomes a target, and you're kind of going, "Oh, I'd love to be, I'd love to be like Lee Evans. I'd like to be like Mo Gilligan. Yes, yeah. Mo Gilligan, it will be inspiring a whole generation of comedians. There you go. That you know, like in the same way that Chappelle is, or Bill Burr is, or mm. whoever these people are, you have access to these people, and they light a fire in you. Or Cristiano Ronaldo, and you go, God, I want to be a footballer like him, or mm. I want to be a footballer like Messi, or whatever it is, and it's it's maybe, hopefully schools do, but certainly it's about recognising you can sit down with Russell all day yeah. and he's going to struggle with maths, but if you get him into war poetry when he's 15, mm -hmm. he's going to really enjoy that. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, Russell really likes football, so he can't tell his mates he likes war poetry. He's got to keep that fucking quiet <laughs> because they're going to rinse him. Um, but I, I think it's, it's about telling kids that there is no fear in the pursuit of, of anything. Of anything. But there isn't, because, but, but, but there is, there's an innate, you're gonna be destroyed in, in Britain. Yeah. Just because that's the way we are. It's like, you can't do that. Mm. You just gotta develop thick skin and, and sort of see where you're going. And that, but you need people that have done that to uh, keep you sane. So shouldn't that, that means that the work we're doing and other organisations like mine, yeah. look how important it is. It's vitally important. It's it so important because it offers something, the, the school system that's been there for 100 years, mm. hasn't really changed much, yeah. even though society's really changed a lot. Yeah. And, um, but we've come with something extra yeah. that offers those young people the role models that they need yeah. at the schools, even though I believe teachers are role models. Yeah. But if you talk to a kid, 
you know, we don't like teachers and maybe there's one favourite, um, you know, but they don't like school. Most of the schools I go in, I do assemblies, I do mm. classroom talks, I ask them. First thing they say is they can't wait to come out of school. But it needs to be more holistic, because you're completely yeah. right. With Teachers are under an enormous amount of pressure. Oh, pressure. Because, because they, you know, in some cases, they have to raise some people's kids. Yes. And, and that is, that's hard. 100%. And if they, you know, if, if they make a mistake with a kid, yeah. which they will, because yeah. they're tired and they're not... Just like parents do. Yeah, totally. So it, but they get more of a rollicking, didn't they? Yeah, right, man. But it's, or they can be judged or rated or analysed. There and you go. Inspectors come in and say, oh, you're not, he's not a very good teacher. Boom. Well, because of the pressure he she or she that. is under. So maybe that's where... And hopefully this is happening, that there's organisations like your, yours or uh, I'm sure there's, th hopefully there's lots like this that sort of add a bit of extra sort of care. Do you know yeah, what I mean? So yeah. To take the pressure off the schooling system. Because exactly some kids are fine going in that mm -hmm. lane. Yep. And some kids just need just, to be out because th their lives are you know, very different mm. and they, they need a, just a bit of a, you know what I mean? We all, yeah. I know kids from when I was at school that you just kind of go, there was, a, there was one of my mates, you know, you know, without naming any names, but he used to get in quite a lot of shit for sort of stealing and that. Mm. Because he never had any food at home. Like, I hear you. So it's like, well, what is he gonna do? There's something it's, behind it, isn't it? Well, this is it, so he's yeah. like, oh, he's a thief. He's got empty cupboards. Mm. That can turn you into a bit of a thief, innit? Yeah, no, because he needs to steal to survive. <laughs> yeah. So, but so that so he's, he's not a munch. But but that's what I mean. But it's that thing of going, okay. So we got to get to the bottom of the, that. That. Yeah. So it's not. He isn't as simple as he's a young that's criminal. Correct. He is. He's somebody that yeah. is forced to yeah. to kind of survive. Yeah. And he's outside. You know I think I mean? that's why we get. I think that's why we get um, great results. Yeah. Because young people see that we're not just looking at what's happening we're looking at behind the backstory yeah you know how, how do you get to think like the way you do up to this point in life yeah and then we be begin to help them to deal with that problem what's your dream for this where, where do you know what is your kind of aim for your kind of organization do you have like a specific vision oh clearly haringey They've got Wood Green as like number one in terms of knife crime. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the stats, um, one of the aims is to take that completely wipe off the stats. Yeah. To demonstrate that if we have the ability to have a premises within an area that's got so much knife crime, that we can create a, a system that allows young people to come through, get the support that's needed, get the opportunities that's needed, because that's what this is about. When I talk to young people, they're all about money, money, money. Not realizing that it's their purpose that they're looking for, and the result of finding what it is that they love to do is being paid for it. Mm. And they've been, they've been deceived into thinking, it's just money I need, because I spoke to a group of young boys that I mentor today. And they admitted, I said, who's, who's attracted by this street life? And they admitted that they are. So they wanna sell drugs, they're into, you know, repping their ends and all of that. And, and I said, what's, what's the takeaway for you? And it's, it's money, it's girls, it's looking good. I said, where did you get that from? It's what they've seen in their estates, in their ends, on the, 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 the films, in movies. All the messages are telling them one thing. If you live like this, if you make these choices, you'll get this. Here's the end result. So I said, if I can offer you a more lucrative way, a more attractive way, without all these consequences and risks to your life, how would you feel about coming on a journey together uh, to get that done. And we ended the session with, yes, Coach Prince, we're in, we're all in. So I'm looking forward to this journey as we move on to see how, how these guys do along the route. That's what we need to do, isn't it? So I was thinking then, so what we need is a show that's like really glamorizes being like a lawyer 
or an engineer. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Uh, or easy. something like that, where they're just kind of like go. just dripping with women because they got <laughs> because they got a, <laughs> they got a bridge right. Love <laughs> like, it. But like, but like, but, but you know what I mean? It is. It's making things. It is. But it's it's also that thing of is trying to express the sort of excitement you get yeah. from, you know, telling a joke, scoring a goal, um, uh, defending a case, yeah. uh, saving someone's life, mm -hmm. uh, putting out a fire. It's kind of all these things. Do you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like you'd imagine, like, let's say if you're a firefighter, for example's sake, I don't know what they get paid. I imagine it isn't what it should be. Yeah. given that they're willing to That's run it. into fucking For fire. Exactly. But they must get like a supersonic feeling yeah. from literally running out of a building That's to someone. It. Like, and that is a, it's quite a difficult thing to uh, quantify. Because mm. it's pretty, it's, you know, you can't put a, you can't put a fee on that. Yeah. But you would imagine they've got flashbacks of horror that mm. they've seen, but also flashbacks of moments where they're like, Shit, I caught that baby. Mm. Or I, I got that, that lady out. You Must know. be awesome, isn't it? Totally, but it's sort of Go about... Go home feeling that I saved the little child's life that could have been burnt. But again, imagine if you went in and you spoke to kids about that, or you made a TV yeah. show about that, yeah. and, and, it, and it sort of really articulated the fact that there are a myriad of, of, of uh, occupations and things you can do with mm. your life that, that send your serotonin uh, and dopamine through the roof, Easy. and it isn't always dosh. No, it's yeah. But it's, it's but like it's not to say money isn't fantastic. Yeah, of course. But the, the interesting thing is when you watch any documentary, you watch like the Beatles, or or Steve Martin's book or whatever. Anyone that gets to the top, they're always miserable as fuck mm. because th they realise that having having all the money and all that, it kind of isn't enough. It's yeah. it's in the quest. Yeah. It's in the, what's the song? Yeah, what is it. it? How does that song go? I want to fight. Even though they're multi-millionaires, mm -hmm. the Beatles are sat around going, what is it? What is mm -hmm. the, th come on, there's gotta be a, a way of doing mm -hmm. it. And that's because it's, if you have a deep love of something you, uh, you're you good at, you can't be stopped, man. So we should be selling the deep love for your passion and not the money, the frills, the girls and the stuff that they have packaged. So here's what you want. Yeah. We should be looking at the satisfaction well, you just you show them. So, for example, it's like if let's take comedy as an example. Mm. If you got those kids to do a five-minute routine yeah. to you know themselves, for example, the the feeling they would get from owning that laughter yeah. is you can't really you can't put a put a price on that because yeah. it's a real it's it. superhero shit. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? That you. So it's about demonstrating. It's not ju and, and allowing them to feel it, mm. whatever whatever it is. Whether yeah. it's, do you know what I mean? It's like, it. it uh, I think maybe it's that. It's sort of spending time with jobs that are so far out of their realm. You know, wh whether it is an engineer, a lawyer, a doctor, yeah. a comedian, a footballer, whatever yeah. it may be, just to kind of f feel the reality of it mm. and just have a little taste of of the magic yeah. to go, oh, fucking hell, I want some of that. Yeah, I'm quite yeah. good at that. I can mm -hmm. fit, you know, I think that is a big, a big thing, isn't it? And then it's not um, hypothetical. Yeah. It, there's a degree of, of realness to it. Because I'm not promoting poverty, because I wouldn't no. last day, no good for anyone. What I am promoting is finding your gifts that has been presented in you as, for me, I know you might have a different view, the manufacturer always places whatever it is that his product can do, it has it within the product to be able to do it. A car, mm. a chair, everything's equipped with what it, what it needs to be able to do what it does. Yeah. My belief is that we're equipped with what we need to do what we've done. Along our journey, we find that out. Mm. Who is that? But if every kid wants to sell drugs and just wants to be a footballer because of the money, then I think there's a problem there and they will find themselves undone when they hit the target, get the money, and feel very unfulfilled because there's a lot more to life than just having that cash. Yeah. It's yeah. about the fulfillment of your purpose on this planet and then making that lucrative. Then you make what your gift is enable you to be able to pay your bills, live the life that you want. Yeah, totally. So when did you understand that you had a gift and it was being a comedian. 
When did you get that? Um, I, I remember doing my first gig uh, when I was 18 and going, I think I know how to do this. And it's sort of that, yeah, I, I just felt so relaxed doing it. I kind of, really? Yeah, totally. It was sort of this weird thing of like, I was quite good at football when I was a kid. I was nowhere near your, your son's level, but I was all right. Yeah. And I felt a real freedom when I played football. Like you didn't, I didn't know that. I was all right, but but you, as in, you, you don't think about tomorrow or yesterday. You're kind of so in the zone. Mm. And then I got to like 18 and sort of realised it's like this is. I'm just nowhere. It's never going to happen. And alongside that, I was kind of writing jokes. I was you in the league? Was you mum played, and dad taking you football? Was yeah, it like yeah, that? yeah. So I used to, I played like. Um, the highest level I used to, I played for like Bays and Stoke Town, yeah. so like sort of semi-professional. I played for their reserves. So that was as high as I got when I was 17. Okay. So it's all right, fairly decent. Do you know what I mean? I've got a decent touch, but, and, and loved football. And mm. just, and so I've always been that kind of a kid where I found a thing and I was like, right, well, I'm just going to do that then. Like you find football when you're eight and you're like, well, I don't need to do anything else. Mm -hmm. This is, this is, every, I was that kid with the ball, you know, kind of everywhere. And, um, and then I kind of got into stand-up when I was like 14 and was writing jokes. And, um, and then when I was 18, I plucked up the courage to, to go and do it. P partly because there was a boy at our school called um, Chris Raymond, who was our head boy. And, um, and he died in a car crash. And he was such oh. a kind of like, but like super handsome, head boy, clever, smart, everyone liked him and suddenly he was, wow. he was gone. So it was a real kind of, right, what's the worst that can happen? Go and do that gig, S stop being afraid, don't tell anyone, go and do it. So I kind of went with this thing of like, right, I can say I've done it and if it's shit, it's shit, doesn't matter. And I did it and, and it was like this kind of sort of slightly outer body moment where you can't, you're sort of looking at yourself and kind of like, you're like this gawky little fucker and your eyes are everywhere and but people are laughing and you're like, whoa, this, this, I've, I, I kind of, I'm kind of good at it. I could feel that, you know, like Neo in the Matrix. It was yeah. a bit like, I could just feel the wow. control. That's you know, hard. it certainly wasn't like that. For the first five gigs, it was like, yeah, this is easy. Yeah. And then the sixth gig, fucking <laughs> like that. And it's just like, boo, you shit. And then, and you deal with that, That's which is the weirdest yeah. feeling when you just go, you know, you're 18, yeah. there's 200 people in a room. I remember this very vividly, jesters in Bristol, just utter silence, complete. And, and you're utter. at home as well. No, 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 I'm, and so I'm on stage and in this moment I crumble and, and I'm broken. But I, what I mean, your own hometown. Mate, yeah, this is it. I'm a kid, I'm not getting paid. This is, I'm 18 years old. And I kind of, I, I wander off the stage to utter silence. Uh, and this has never happened. The first five gigs have been amazing. So it's gonna be great for me. I then like, it's so awful that I then, um, I sort of sit in the dressing room surrounded by all these kind of famous, not famous, but professional comedians and, and they've all been through what I've been through. So they're like, yeah, it's all right. And they're like hardened, eh, shit happens. And I'm there going, oh, like, but not knowing how to deal with it. Yeah. But you, that's what happens to all of us, that you, you have that moment of real, you know, you miss the penalty. Yeah. You, you miss the penalty in the penalty yeah. shootout. Somebody gets around you. What did the, it do to you? It made me realize that I had to work a lot harder because I wasn't, as naturally gifted as I thought I was. I and that I have to work hard to ensure that I don't feel that pain again because the first five felt electric. So I can't be complacent. I have to, and then I watched these professional comics that I was on who were brilliant. And I was like, and I watched them at the back. And I was like, right, how do I get to be as good as that? How can I figure it out? And then you kind of put yourself back together and you go again. Well, wow, cause this, this sounds, quite a piece of a journey from that, you know, maybe teenager yeah. that wore his jeans the other way round. Oh yeah, so nice. So you could look cool. You've, you've done your research, look, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. I did that once. Come I should on, point out, on, I did that once. Come on, don't yeah, leave sorry, me, sorry. Um, um, Yeah, it was, uh, and because my dad agreed, my dad was yeah. like, yeah, it seems like a good idea. It fucking wasn't, man. <laughs> your dad was up for it. My dad said it was a good idea. My dad brushed my hair that day 
and said, yeah, put your jeans on the wrong your way. Your dad is the one, mate. He's a fucking lunatic. <laughs> I've got to meet him, man. But I went, yeah, he'd love to meet you. Um, and where did you get that from? Where, where did you get the, the whole idea from? From, do you remember Chris I Cross? I remember Chris yeah. Cross, but I didn't da- want to say Daddy it. Daddy Mac make you jump, jump. Yeah. Um, did you jump? <laughs> I couldn't, because my jeans were on the wrong way. Um, I couldn't have a piss. <laughs> Like, uh, that was the biggest problem. You just sort of realised that to have a piss, you have to sort of unbuckle your jeans backwards. And that's too uh, funny, man. Seriously. Yeah. But so then I was that kid at the disco that had yeah. a, You know what I mean? There's always that one kid that has a piss with his jeans right down the bottom. And yeah, you're like, yeah, yeah. I have to give this guy some, <laughs> some room because he ain't well. Um, yeah, it was awful. And it, well, my mates kept undoing my jeans. <laughs> so that, and I was like, get the fuck off. Like that. So the whole night was disastrous. Uh, so what, what was the build up to that? What did you want I to be know. cool? Yeah, I just wanted to. You didn't think you fitted in. You wanted to fit in more, like a lot of the young people. Yeah, it was. I just wanted to impress. I think I wanted to impress girls, and I saw uh, uh, crisscross, and I thought these guys. Yeah, I they're think, killing it. I think they're killing it. I think. I think I could. <laughs> I could. Um, I don't know, Mark. I don't know why I made that choice. No, I, was, so, I was 11 years old. It, it looked cool. Okay. It's not the first mistake I've made. I remember when I was 18, I went on a holiday to, where did we go? We went to Magaluf. Yeah. And the day before we, we went, me and my friends, um, my brain was like, you know what you got to do to make yourself more interesting and stand out to girls? I was like, yeah, OK, I'm listening. You need to dye your hair blue. <laughs> OK, right, OK. Should we do that? Let's do it now. Let's go to Tesco and let's dye our hair blue. So your dad sets you up. Mate. Your mate set you up. And then up. my brain's telling me to do it. And I, do you remember those good luck trolls that you used to have on the end of a pencil? Yes, It's like yes. one of them. So I'm fucking walking around Magaluf with, like, blue hair, and everyone's like, what happened to you? And you're like, what? Like, who wants blue hair? The only people that have blue hair are, like, old ladies, you know? I looked utterly ridiculous. But you, you make mistakes. I had one of those. On the you? pencil, it was a rubber. Yeah, yeah. And the two fingers went like this. Oh, nice. So I just decided when I was walking my little brother one day, I saw this older. I don't know why I decided to, yeah, I'm going to stick up the oh. pencil to him. Bad idea, yeah, man. Yeah, mate. I don't know what took me. And what happened? He looked like this. His face changed, it was on. I was <laughs> off, mate. I wish I was on my own, though. Yeah, yeah. I was you got to carry brother. your brother, yeah, I had yeah. to carry my brother. But I was farcy at them yeah. times, so I, I made it, and he said, I'll get you, I'll get you, don't worry. I thought, yeah, 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 mate, whatever. He did. Oh. He caught me, yeah, about, must have been about a week later. Uh, I was getting home, and he must have seen us, but I didn't see him. So he hid behind the wall. And um, when, and when I was walking past with my brother to go home for lunch, I just see my brother disappear. It's like, huh? When I looked over there, my brother was being held by the neck by the same guy. He said, yeah, yeah, what now? What now? Oh, I'm going to beat up your brother. But the thing is, he didn't realise, I was shit scared. But now you got my brother, you are better off getting me. Because, you know, i got to look after my brother. And he's my number one care. Yeah. So if you got him, or however I was scared, that fear went away because my brother came before me. Yeah. All of a sudden, I said, you better let my brother go right now, mate. And he was like, yeah, or what? By the time he dashed my brother aside, I unleashed some combinations that obviously he didn't know. My dad used to make us train every day, sweating, you know, and if we weren't sweating, we couldn't eat dinner until we was training hard, yeah, that's wow. what it was like growing up. So I gave him a beat down. I actually got pretty well known and famous for that because I didn't know he was three years above me. So say like I was in year seven, he'd probably be year eight, nine, 10. He'd be in year 10 and beating up a year 10 now is a big deal. It's a huge thing. So, so, and I was going primary school and he was at senior school. So that was a quite a big beat down. And, I kind of liked that when I was young. So here's the thing to ask you, to like, because that's like a f- fucking funny story. Yeah. Given what's happened with your life, mm-hmm. how do you think, how do you feel about stories like that now? Because it's sort of like that, that sort there, there is a, it's a real rite of passage, isn't it? Because I've, I've had those instances. I never won the fight, yeah. obviously. But, but I, you know, I was mouthy and took quite a lot of slaps down the years, mm-hmm. which is kind of sort of part of growing up, isn't it? Yeah, you sort it of is. like, you just take a beat and want to up. But we sort of now live in a world where those things are probably happening now with kids. Yeah. 
And w what does that make you feel? Like, sorry to put you in a weird yeah. place, but how no, do you feel cool. like it's sort of... What would your advice be now to kids in that situation, given that he might have had a knife? Well, if it was you now... Yeah. If it was now, he probably would have had a knife waiting for me. Yeah, but that's what I mean. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so it's a whole different advice. It's a whole different talking where before you might tell your you, yeah, do this and that, you know, be brave. Yeah. Now I'm telling my you, listen, any problems, you got feet, two feet, run. Yeah. But it's so funny, isn't it? It's not funny. Funny's not the right word. But yeah. It's, it's so different given that. That's it. When I was a kid, when you were a kid, the thing is, it's like, well, you've just got to face up to it. Like, the big thing I remember as a kid is, like, the advice was always, like, yeah, you just need a slap and then you'll be all right. That's it. Like, it's sort of, like, what he needs is a good beating and it'll improve him. But that sort of mentality, it, can't, it just can't work yeah, anymore because work. things are too, too insane. Yeah, it's too different now. You know? So now you're getting all the kids where we could take... Not that we could take shame and embarrassment because it was just as important to us not to be shamed and embarrassed when you're young. It's such an important deal. You want me to shame, yeah. shame. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. now when they feel shame and embarrassment, it's like someone has to pay. Yeah. Social media, everyone seeing what you said, you know, the picture you took, whatever. So then you'll find kids coming back and like, seriously hurting another kid or killing another kid based on shame. what's going on. And yeah. that's just shame and embarrassment. That's a part of growing up. Yeah. You have to feel, you have to experience that human emotion. Yeah. So it kind of gets you ready. It's like catching a cold. It's like knocking yourself and, you know, realizing, oh, you put your you know, hand on the fire, you get burnt. I know what it feels like to be burnt. I know what it feels like to scrape my leg. Mm. You have to go through these experiences. So without that, you're not developing yourself in the right way. And this is what's happening, what I think is happening with young people. They're not being developed in the right way because they're not able to handle anything. Because how can you then decide that I'm going to kill somebody as a result of making me feel like this? Yeah. It's a part of your human experience. Yeah. So you felt that I'm going to put these jeans on and another occasion you felt that what I loved about my story about my brother and the story I read about you was that you were just as protective. Of my little brother. Of your little brother. Yeah, but it's funny, isn't it, with little brothers, because like- We've no, got that in common, man. But nobody, I bet you're the same, like nobody is meaner to my little brother than me. Than you. But- Same here. If anybody is, is mean to your little brother- Mate, they're gonna pay. Yeah, it's just, but, it, but that's love, isn't it? It's kind of that, <laughs> It's that weird thing with love, man. Yeah. It's just, it's such an odd, but also because my brother had epilepsy, so I kind of felt like, and also he was kind of mouthy, and so I was just always having it's a- It's quite similar, you saw yourself. Well, I was just having to help him all the time, do you know what I mean? Hey. Because, and, but yeah, I, I, I love him. I think how, how did you feel about that? Did, did you feel any animosity? Did you feel any annoyance, any frustration because you had that role to play? Or did it make you feel important growing up? Did you love that role? That's a really good question. I think I, I don't really know if I knew any other, uh, anything different. I was always the, the kind of, uh, because I was the, the first born, mm. so I would always make the mistakes and then, or I, I was always the first to do something. And then my brother and sister would sort of come with. Um, so I sort of, became this sort of de facto, what you want to do is this. You know what I mean? I'm, I see. I was always passing on tips. Do you know what I mean? If, if best, when you're 11, put your trousers on the right way. Um, <laughs> that's bad. Um, when, you're, uh, when you're 12, don't go on the waltzers, ironically, because the kids in the year above will spin that until you're sick, and everyone's going to call you a teacup for about four years. You know what I mean? So it was kind of like I made so many silly mistakes yeah. where I made a dick out of myself. And then I would sort of come back to my brother and go, right, here's what we've learned. You know, so it was sort of that yeah. many. And also football, like you know, um, is such a currency when mm. you're a kid. Yeah. So if you're good at football, it. the, it's, it's an instant yeah, passport yeah, towards right. leave my brother alone. That's oh, because he's really good. You know okay. what I mean? It's sort of all that yeah, shit, yeah, you know? Yeah. And then comedy, being funny is also part of it. Nice. It's like, if you can't fight, which I couldn't, it's like you have to be, when I was a kid, you had to be funny or good at sport. That was your only way mm 
of meaning you didn't have the fuck kicked out of you. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And, and but I won. That's the thing, isn't it? About growing up in this country, it's sort of whether it's changed now. I don't know. There's probably schools where that doesn't happen. There's probably schools where it's a thousand times worse. Hey. But it was that thing of like the the sword of Damocles of having the shit kicked out of you was hanging over you every single day. It was bizarre. Real. See, that's the way we're raised. It's mm. odd, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. If you go to like a comprehensive school or whatever, there isn't that sense of like, and you can't tell the teacher because if you tell the teacher, things will be, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's all that. Mm-hmm. It's, it's hard. the same now. We must be even worse now because what we didn't yeah. have when we were kids is, okay, so um, I have the memory of the trousers, yeah. but nobody took a photo. Uh, no, nobody put yeah. it on. Li- nobody put it online. Yeah, yeah. Nobody, you know, it's sn- a big difference. Snapped me at the urinal with my trousers <laughs> by my ankle. But do you know what I mean that would? But that would have destroyed yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. And like you say, that who's to say that wouldn't have put me into a circle of mania mm-hmm. where I'm like, right, somebody needs to pay. Hundred percent. You know, yeah. and and I think that's what girls and boys clearly have to contend with. Contend with now, it's just so difficult, mm-hmm. man, because you you're, you can be attacked at any <clears throat> time of the day. You mm-hmm. can be mocked at any time of the yeah. day. You can be celebrated at any time of the day. Yeah. You can literally know how popular you are. Imagine that. Yeah. When we were kids, you had to guess how popular you were. Now you can go, I, I'm, look at you that. You can measure it. I've got 300. Wow. 300 friends. What you, got? you got? Totally. It's you know, and it's, in it. it's insane. I'm always and, telling them that. What does that mean? But, but, but the problem is, what it means is it's, it's, it's immediate um, uh, validation. Yeah. To kind of go, and that's amazing yeah. and awful at the same time because you can, you can do something really funny, send it out, and a thousand people go, that's the funniest thing I've ever there seen. You you, you're great. So you're like, you feel amazing. Yeah. And why shouldn't you? What a wonderful thing. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. It's, you're then chasing it to try and match it again, then you yeah. do something else. Oh, I only got 300. Yeah. So you're, you're kind of, you're trying to live vicariously okay. through other people. You're trying to ga- gain their pleasure. And because we haven't developed ourselves mentally, physically, young people feel like they've grown, they've Which matured, hard. but then mentally, that yeah. one person, even grown-ups have to deal with this, yeah. the one person that's talked some shit on your platform, yeah. you focus on that. Yep. They say that it's crap, you're not this. I've, I've, I get young people talking to me about this, and that's their focal point, is on that part of things. Mate. Well, how, how it affected them and messes them up. Well, exa- and that, you're completely right. That isn't a kid thing. Yeah. That, that is a human thing. Yeah, you're that, right. That nobody likes to... You're right. But nobody likes to feel bad. Yeah. And, and uh, that kind of vulnerability and, and it's sort of the tangibility of somebody in, in letters just going, kind of, you are shit. I I I, you know, I hate you. Because yeah, grown ups are dealing with this on a daily basis now. We all it? are, but we but but this this. You're right. It's sort of there's so many options where you can be made to feel foolish, mm-hmm. and we're slightly lucky in that, you know, as as adults, you can sort of do that a bit. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. like I've had, you know, yeah. I I have sort of shitty things said about me, and it's sort of you feel terrible about yeah. it. And then you just kind of go, okay, cool, that's fine. Boom. But obviously when I'm younger, yeah, yeah. I remember when I first started going on TV, you'd have like 20 lovely things, one horrible thing. Mm. You just focus on the horrible no. thing. Mm. And I would go the route of thinking, well, they're right, mm. they're completely right, I am worthless, I am shit, mm. and it would sort of eat at me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was my personality. Mm. But if your personality is, who the fuck said that? Right, like, let's it. fucking go. Yeah, the, 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 yeah it's, that'll it's, come out. But that's sure. the problem that, that, that social media has created more potential for scuffles. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is, a thing that I think is really interesting is that, you know, Facebook, Twitter, all these companies, Mm. they do all they can to avoid paying tax in in, in different countries. Mm -hmm. So you have a problem where they're creating societal problems. We're talking sexual abuse, we're talking mental abuse, we're talking fighting, we're talking all these things. But the police are having to spend money on on all these things. But but there's no then they they're literally creating a societal problem mm. that needs money to fix it and they're not putting the money to in fix it. because they're you know they're going that they're based so, out of somewhere they don't have to pay their tax and they're multi millionaire owners trying yeah. to go to the fucking moon yeah so accountability <laughs> comes to mind integrity comes to mind well, but but also they're quite literally the problem is they're creating let's not muck around it, 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 the social media creates 
wonder and beauty and 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 oh, straight. and loveliness. Yeah, and you see yeah. things. Even some of the things you put a thing on your feed that I saw the other day, and yeah. there was a kid that wrote a letter to you, and it was really beautiful. And it was really mm. nice, and you could tell he wasn't a kid that regularly wrote letters, and mm. it took something for him to write a letter. Yeah. And he wrote it to you. Mm. You've obviously asked him. Said, "Do you mind if I put this up?" Yes, He's yeah. got no problem. That that is, it's really like mm. it's. I so I see that and go, "Ah, oh, that's amazing." Yeah. But also, there's true horror on there, and there's true yes. problems, mm. and they're not putting money into it. Yeah. And like you look at like you you know the sort of the amount of shit the footballers get. You know, sort of racism is yeah, raising yeah, its head really. again. So it's sort of like it's like how, how do we? try and sort of solve these societal problems. And one of the ways is you can pay for the um, facilities that have to be hired to solve the problems that you fucking started. Wow. But, but you know, that seems so obvious mm. that it should happen. But, yeah. you know, international accounting and all this kind of stuff, it's like, how are you going to make that happen? But mm. for me, that seems like... One for, of first and foremost, one of the solutions. Well, absolutely. Yeah. It, it, so it seems like you should at least, given the amount of money you're making, mm -hmm. you should at least yeah. put some long. money towards the problems you're causing. All day long. You know. All day long. But I love your. I got to get back into your comedy because I know that there's young comedians coming up. Yeah. Want to know more? How do you? What do you say that you're going to come up with? Is it just naturally in you? Do you just start? writing stuff and are confident that this is funny. How do you know what's funny? Well, this is it. So I'm coming up with new material. It's your first material. Before you talk about your new one, yeah. your first material that you come up with, what did you, because I'm sure it wasn't, I'm sure it weren't the same as what you had in the, no. the Good News programme. No, no, it was, yeah, it wasn't. What was my first, the first thing that was really f funny, Trying to think, it was a it was a it was a joke about. Uh, do you remember uh, Spock? Yeah. Yeah. So it was this little joke of like, how did Captain Kirk get through all of the Star Trek episodes without once flicking his ears? And it was sort of this thought. I thought one day of like, because if that was me, I'd be like, right, we got to fuck off. <laughs> like, so it was this little bit of silliness. Yeah. That that I was like, oh, I think that's quite funny. And I remember telling that, and it kind of got a laugh. Yeah. And then it's sort of, I would muck around with the crowds and yeah. I would sort of, but the older I get, the Well, just naturally, I without would, nothing scripted, you just naturally. I did initially, yeah. Okay. And, the, and then the, the further on, what I do now is I'll make a note on my phone. So, and then, and then I'll kind of have a think about it. And then I'll go to a club, don't get paid. Um, just do 20 minutes and just try it out and just go Bruh. smoking because I've then, heard that before from yeah. like Kevin Hart and these other guys. Is that is that the is that the model? Yeah, that is to be used. So young people listening, you need to be taking this on board. That's the model to use. Yeah, go yeah. and go and try it out. Just yeah. go to a club somewhere, yeah. not being paid, and try out your just gigs. Try it out. Try out the material. Try out the thoughts. And then nice. listen, like record it if you can on your phone, yeah. and then listen back to it. That's painful, but it's super useful. So that when you, you you're crafting it, mm. you kind of you know it changes. And you watch someone like Kevin Hart, yeah. or you watch someone like Bill Burr, whoever. That, that you might watch them at the beginning of a tour, mm. let's say, and the, the the story is like that, yeah. and then it gets a little bit bigger or it twists this way, or it goes over there. 100%. And it's about following your nose. So yeah. it's sort of whatever you think is kind of funny. Sometimes it doesn't have to be profound and deep. It can mm. be silly. Like, mm. like where I live in Camden, I, saw, I was taking my dog for a walk the other day, and it, I was in this park, and I was like, my dog's the only dog in this park that's not wearing clothes. <laughs> and. And that, I was like... Su fully suited. Mate, but there, were, there, there was a fucking... Like, I seen a greyhound with gloves on. Up. Mate, he had, he had gloves on. And he yeah, saw... But he looked like Peter Crouch on MDMA. Oh, okay. He was just kind of like... And it, but it just, in my head... Uh, Crouch, we love you, man. But, but yeah, totally, yeah. Big fan. <laughs> um, but, but the point I'm making, it was sort of like... It, it just made me chuckle. Yeah. Of like, that, that's definitely... You know, it's, it strikes me, the more well-off people are the more clothes they're putting on their dog. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? a fucking chihuahua in like a trench coat. And I was going, oh, there's something funny in that. Yeah. And how do the dogs feel? 
when they see each other? Okay, what, really? Is there a conversation that's going on? Do, yeah. they, do they feel shame? Do they, like, you know, that's so all cool. these things. So what happens is you all have had that. Your brother will have had that. Yeah. D'Angelo will have had that. You, where yeah. you've seen something funny in your head mm -hmm. you, and your brain goes Brrr, and it's very, it's sort of like visual that my brain instantly saw the dog, saw the greyhound, that was funny. And then your job as a comedian is to find the words oh, that, that articulate the vision that you had. I see. It really is. It's sort of like, okay, I saw that. Mm. Okay, how do I make that as funny to people yeah. as it was to me? Okay. Because my brain straight away was like, I was imagining a conversation between my dog and mm. theirs and like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And my dog was like, Jesus Christ, get hold of yourself. What's wrong? Don't let them fucking do this. You're not an elf. You're a dog. Whatever. But it, it, I was like, okay, cool. I've got to go to a gig and I've got to explore that. Yeah. I don't know whether that's funny now. Yeah. It might be, it might not be. But like you say, if you, if, if you're get, if you want to get into stand-up or whatever, there's loads of gigs mm. all across London, all across the country. And you, you do a thing called an open spot. And you have a think about the five minutes you're going to do mm. and then figure out what it's going to be and then tell the story and tell it well. That's mm. all you can do. And then you do it again. And it's, it's sort of that. It's kind of, it's, it's no different to the gym. It's kind of like, okay, okay. you've yeah. just done, you've okay. just done 20 reps. Can okay. you do 22? Can yeah. you do 23? Okay. It's that. And That's it, where I was going to go. Yeah. It's super addictive and it's sort of, I don't know. It's, it's a, Comedy is a mechanism through which you can do life. Mm. So pain or joy or any of these sort of deep emotions can be dealt with through laughter. You know, they really can. And we've, we've had, we've all had moments in life where um, I even in truly dark moments, like I've laughed at funerals mm. with all my family, you know, I remember my my, that's my great. no, but, but and like in a, I didn't in a, think in, I could laugh again, but I'm, I laugh. Yeah, so that's really well, no, good. Absolutely. Yeah, it, and it's sort of and and I'm willing to bet the first time you laughed after your life had been mm. turned inside out. Yeah. It's it's a way of of of, of let your body realizing in some tiny way mm. that that part of you is healing. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. No, yeah. no, no, that sounds wanky and it sounds profound, but yeah. there is, when you're laughing, truly, mm -hmm. you can't mm -hmm. be anything other than laughing. That's correct. Right? That's you know right. what I mean? And it's, it's right. a, it's a, it's a moment of peace yeah. from the grind of yeah. life where you just go, okay, I'm gone for a bit. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like a societal orgasm. Yeah. Yeah. Like really is where you're like, you're, oh, you, you, but you're not thinking about, yeah anything, you're kind of lost in that giggle. It's a really- Do you know, it's weird, yeah, you're talking about this because I'm getting like memories of thinking how strange it was to have such deep grief in the household and hearing sounds and noises coming out of myself and people I've never heard before, wells and screams of pain, yeah? Because what you're thinking about comes out in this grief and this noise. And at the same time, over time, you'll hear laughter and joking in the house because my, my family, we're, 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 we're quite crazy. We're quite, we love jokes. We love mucking around. Um, mm. and, and the people that we're around kind of share that same way. So that wasn't completely, that didn't die. It was still in there. So that means we didn't die. And, and even though there was this serious pain and you feel like you can't live on, there was still life in it. Once you was talking, I thought, yeah, that was a sign of life. Mm. If you could still laugh and look at things in a funny way, and you know, someone comes around, because Jay said something when we was outside, and went through something and he felt like he was dying. And one of his mates, when he sent this message, and he sounded like he was dying on the message, just was cracking up. Just saying, oh, Jay, oh, I'm dying. And he said he needed that. Mm. So where someone else went, how could you act like this when I'm at my worst? But it lifted him. He said he needed to come out of that kind of deaf mindset. Mm. And the laughter kind of brought him round and made him feel like I can, I'm going to survive, I'm going to do this. 
Yeah, well, that's weirdly, that's why my Netflix special, that's why I called it Lubricant. Because yeah, that's it. it Laughter is the lubricant that makes life livable. That's excellent, man. But it's true, though, eh? Yeah. Because it's sort of, it, not for everybody, but for a lot of people, it's... That's it's, a brilliant word to put. That's why you called it that. Lubricant, yeah. There's yeah. a lot of disappointed perverts. <laughs> there's, there's, no, there's not one mention of KY Jelly. It's just this guy's... But, um, but, like, it's true, yeah. man. It's sort of like... But that, so that <clears throat> first, that, here's a question. So that first moment where you'd gone through that grief and you, yeah. you did laugh, did you feel like you, did you feel guilty for laughing? Do you see what I mean? Mm. Like, did, did you feel guilty for having the audacity to try and get better? You don't have to answer first, that. First, you know first, I mean? first, let's deal with the time span. In no shape or form could you find anything funny in the early stages of that. Yeah. So just kind of give and take the time span. When you do first start laughing, it's only natural that that thought comes in your head where you feel like, I shouldn't be laughing, mm. I can't be laughing. And the other thought comes into your head and says, but you're alive, you're, you're here. Mm. This is what your son would want for you to live. So you have this conversation yeah. with yourself and in the end, if you make the right choice, it will allow you to laugh. And in fact, my conversation was, you should be laughing harder than anybody else. You should be living life more deeply, more passionate. You should be loving deeper. You should be kinder. You should be experiencing this human experience and contributing more than everyone because of the pain that you've gone See, through. This, but this, that is what's fucking fascinating about you. Because that, it's just incredible. But your sort of zeal and zest for life is nuts, man. Because you're right. But it seems like that it's... Yeah, cross you know, over. That's what people find hard. Cross over. Yeah. Just, just, just take that step. It's like this difficult block that we have. I, I can't. It's almost like, how can I let go of this? Yeah. Like, if I let go, then... I don't know what we feel holding on to unforgiveness, anger, bitterness, grief. I don't know what we think it's gonna do, but we really want some kind of improvement in our peace, self-satisfaction, life, whatever. And whatever's left in me, then I have to give all of it. Because what my man showed me is it could have ruined me. Yeah. It could have sent me drinking, drugs, whatever it is. But I chose my choice. And I know that we may differ on this, but me personally, Russell, I believe in the manufacture of human beings. They yeah, set I'm, this president. Totally. And I said, you want us to love. And this has come to break that in me to stop me from showing love, caring for people. And I refuse, I'm gonna stick to how you want me to live and who you are. They say God is love, this is what. So I'm, I wanna be that more than ever now. Mm. I wanna show that I'm your kid, you're my dad. So I'm gonna show that connection and not let the other side get, a, get their grips into me. Yeah. Because that's what it was doing us. Yeah. It was absolutely eating away at me. Revenge Russ was eating away at me every day. One day, I literally just said, I feel like I'm dying. I feel like a bit of me is just getting eaten away with every negative thought, every thought of murder and killing and that's consumed me. I'm up in the night just imagining until if I looked at myself, I probably would have had a smile on my face. But what was I thinking about? Killing this guy bringing me pleasure. Mm. But really, what was it doing? It was eating away at me and killing me. And what do I want to say when I meet Kyan again? What do I want to be able to share with him about the story of what happened? Once? I would love to show him that the dad that brought you up with the morals, the principles that, you, that I wanted you to follow, that just because you got killed, I threw them away. That means what I taught you, I didn't believe in. Fucking hell, that's all right, innit? Listen, I'm gonna have to do that back to you. That's the hard bit. Fuck yeah, it's weird, but, but that's, but what's in, I think this is probably why you're, 
you have a, such a deep connection with kids is because ev every single part of your story is engrossing. And if they, you know, so you are going to meet young people that could potentially be Kyan. They yep. could be yep. potentially the guy that, mm -hmm. that killed Kyan. Yep. They could be the guy that saw what mm -hmm. was going to happen and mm -hmm. didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And and or they could become Kyan's dad. Mm -hmm. So and you just spending time with you, it's not it's not a hypothetical. Yeah. It's it's someone's real story and it I just you. it cuts, man. Yeah. You know, it's so Let's talk about love, because I love that. When did you first experience loving a woman? Because you know, as kids we just want to get in there and get some action, tell yeah. our mates we got one in there, <laughs> broke my cherry. Yeah, I was the last time my mates, I was 15, and, my, and at my school that was like, oh, Brad, I know, Brad, mate. You was the hot guy, you done better than me. Oh, really? How old yeah, were you? I was 17, bruv. Really? I was 17. Mate, you'd have got destroyed at my school. Oh, I would have definitely got finished. <laughs> yeah, but the reason why I got away with it, because everyone thought I was a ladies' man, so assumed that I'd be getting it in the, in the dozens, mate. Yeah. They right. assumed, so I, I didn't do anything. No, that's not me. Stop, yeah. stop thinking that. But it's so like funny, that. isn't it, that you carry... I just left them. But this, see, that's another big thing, isn't it? Like, being a, being a boy when you're young. Yeah. There's a kid at our school who lost his virginity, he was 13, right? Yeah. And then the next day in maths, um, I was like, oh mate, can I borrow your, your ruler? And yeah. he just went, virgin. <laughs> like that, and you're like, mate, just you literally, like it's like, what? And it's like, so, and then he's like, he's right, boobs on the calendar, that's what you'll never touch, like that. And, it, and then it so it becomes this weird thing yeah. that you're like 13 years old. Yeah. And you're like, oh God, yeah, well, I got have sex with a woman. This yeah, is, yeah, pressure, isn't it? But it's just this insane thing of like, you know, Girls wanted it to be special and boys just wanted it done. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, sort yeah. Of this thing. So in terms of love, I don't know, it's sort of, when was the first time I felt love? Probably my, uh, I t I, this is an honest, true story. I remember mm. the first time I met my wife. Yeah. This is genuinely true. I said uh, to my brother on the way home, I said, I'm gonna marry her. Really? Yeah, yeah, that night, bizarre. I also, that night, I gave my brother, I bet him 20 quid if he'd eat a can of dog food. <laughs> so there was, there was a lot happening. But, um, but yeah, I remember there was a... Uh, Did he eat it? Yeah, a bit of it, so I didn't pay him. Yeah, exactly. But, um, he, there's a song called, um, uh, the, well, the lyrics, there's a David Gray song where yeah. it goes, feels like lightning running through my veins every time I look at you. And that's kind of what I felt. When I oh, yeah, first yeah, met yeah. my wife, there was I was like going, whoa. So there's a soppy side of of, of, of Russ. Oh yeah, but isn't there for everyone? It's just kind of yeah. like well, you know, maybe not not everyone. Ah no, everyone's had that moment where somebody smiled or you've seen someone's eyes or you know they've you, you know you just you sort of lose yourself a bit, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of. Yeah, but like love's is sort of a deep yeah. one, isn't it? Do yeah. you know what I mean? It's You're romantic. Of, Am I not, not really? Okay. Are you? Uh, I think you'd have to ask the missus that. Yes, she got, that was a big nod. It was, that was lovely, nod. Yeah, she was like, it was that was full, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. There you go, that's all right, isn't it? <laughs> what are we dealing go. with? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's the way to be, yeah. yeah. But, and is that, have you always been romantic or is that what you were sort of saying about beforehand? That was your kind of, uh, sort of desire that the people in your life, you were going to try and make their life as great as it could be? No, I just remember being young and watching um, some movies, love film, love movies and... Porn. It's called porn. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I knew nothing that's about porn until I ran away from home. No, I didn't. What? On the way to school, I used to knock up my mate and his mum used to do nursing and she was upstairs sleeping and he'd put on the porn videos on. I'm not going to mention the name, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To put the porn on and, you know, quiet, after a while, too, quiet. well, very quiet. Yeah, was, she's asleep. Yeah, yeah. No volume was on yeah, there. Yeah. But everyone was like this, standing out. Sometimes there were two, three, four of us and yeah. we'd come in the morning to go. So we'd have a quick 10 minutes, then we were off. Yeah. So I'd be left with those images like, amazing. I, know. I just saw some pussy. I, I had my mate at school was like that. He would sort of go around his house and then put it on and we'd sort of all sit around kind of watching, and it's just a weird thing, isn't it? Because it's like, like as, 
It's not it really. It's not, your yeah, body. it's not a spectator you know, it's, sport. Yeah, yeah, you're not like with each other. Going, it's, no. good, it's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> it's like it's. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. not like this is a really good movie. Yeah, no, you know. you're not saying that, man. But um, yeah, I was. Uh, what was the question? What were we talking about? Yeah, we were talking about love. Love and movies. To so you, no, so you used to watch love movies. Yeah, and I remember just feeling like I want that. Okay. I want to be in love. Yeah. I want to have someone really special. I want to treat someone really special. I remember that feeling from, from, from a kid, just watching certain movies. There's one particular movie, and I don't know how I've forgotten it, that was really, really famous film. Harry Met Sally? It was before that. Remember, I'm an OG. It was before that. Oh, gosh. Is it uh, 101 Dalmatians when they eat, <laughs> they, eat the spaghetti, they eat the spaghetti together? And you're like, oh, fucking hell, enough no. of that. What's that one? Lady, is that Lady in the Tramp? Is that the one, Lady in the Tramp? Oh, I feel so bad. What got you going? It's what just, is it? It's just, it's, uh, it's the jabs. And I took to the brain. It took away some of my old my, my memories from oh, the kids. Oh, that's brutal. So, you uh, got, so someone <laughs> punched you and kicked that movie out your head? Clean oh. out. I could see the faces. These famous individuals. Oh, they go sleepers in Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> I love the idea they're just nodding. In it, one jab. Darius done it. I'll play him. He had the hardest flipping jabs, mate. Um, yeah, so I just kind of wanted to know more about that and how, you know, because you're not a dad yet. No. You haven't had any kids. So, do you think you'd be a good dad? I've seen you on your programs with the kids, and I absolutely it's love it. It's great, that, isn't it? Yeah, I they're, love they're it. They're amazing. Does yeah. that make you feel like you want to be a dad? Does it make you feel like, I reckon I'll be a good dad? What do you feel when you're doing the movies, if anything? I'd love to be a dad, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, ho and hopefully, touch wood. Um, yeah, um, yeah, I kind of, I, I love hanging out with kids. What I love. Your rapport with them is awesome, man. Yeah, but I think it's because I've never had like a proper job, so I don't have a boss. Like, yeah. and I sort of, I think I'm quite, I think, well, only from my nephews mm. and my niece, they look at me and it, I think they can sense that I'm different. Okay. As in, I've, they don't ever see me in a certain way. Do you know okay. what I mean? That I'm kind of like, like, I don't know, there's just something about me to kids that they oddly kind of gravitate to me yeah. and I yeah. talk to them in a strange way. And open up. And, but I, what I love yeah. most is, so I've got this niece mm -hmm. who's lovely. She's got like really blue eyes, like corkscrew hair, mm. and she is, angry about everything like but like kind of like you know that wild anger where you're like i don't really so we were around there at christmas mm. and and i'm i'm up quite early and for some, whatever reason she's up early and she's just got like a nappy on right she's like free and she's got a full trifle in her hand don't know how mm. you know like a big trifle so she walks in with a trifle i'm watching like match of the day from the night before and I'm like, you're right. It's like sort of nine in the morning. It's just me and her up, and she's like, "There's too much trifle," like that. And I'm like, "What? I, I, it's too much." And I was like, "Okay, well, what, what do you want me to do? Take it away!" Like, and I sort of take the trifle off, and she went, "No!" I said, "Well, what do you want?" She went, "It's too much trifle." <laughs> so I was like, "What? You want me to get some of the trifle out of the bowl?" Yes. So, okay. So do you want me to eat it? Eat that trifle. So I'm like kind of eating trifle. <laughs> and she's like, enough. And then she walks off with the trifle. <coughs> Evidently, that's what she wanted. And it just made me laugh so much that it was just like, that, that is a wild fury. Oh it's just God. like, that she's literally going around and going, there's too much of this fucking custard and cream and jack. <laughs> That pricks up. You! Uh, eat, eat three quarters of it! <laughs> no! Like that. Be right if you need any help with that. Yeah, yeah. but it just, Everything. but it was so funny to me, like, that it, maybe because I'm, that I, I don't really have like a normal job or whatever, yeah. but I was sort of able just to indulge her madness. Mm. And it was so funny and mad. Yeah. And it's like, that will be a memory that I'll always have. Nice. And you'll always have, and hopefully I'll see her when she gets married, mm -hmm. and I'll, you know, go up to her husband and go, fuck, you know, she got a thing for trifling. <laughs> but don't, and then, don't make her laugh. Yeah, 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 exactly. She's, yeah, she's got a bit of a thing, and then she'll be embarrassed, but she'll kind of love yeah, it, and it's, yeah. it's sort of, that's what I love about kids. You have mm. these kind of strange moments, or I love, I love kids succeeding at stuff. Mm. I love, like, particularly when we do playground politics, when the kids are funny and they see me laugh, there's, there's a bit of a moment where they're kind of like, is he laughing at me? No. And they, they realize that I'm not, I'm laughing yeah, with no, them. No. And they, you can see them, Just kind of they, honestly, when they get a big laugh, 
and then all the camera guys are like laughing, going, oh, you're so funny. You can oh, see them, awesome. the shoulders go yeah. back, and then yeah. they start getting really funny. Yeah. It's really yeah. cool. It's, it's and then, lot, and their yeah. brains, there was one particular boy yeah. that it just absolutely did me in, that he was basically, I was talking about Boris Johnson, yeah. and he was saying that, uh, you know, in fairness, uh, uh, he, he eats um, 5,000 calories a day, yeah. and he eats kind of like, sometimes he'll have a cheat meal, and he has like 20 pancakes every day, and that's pretty good, and some of his films are pretty good. And I went, whoa, 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 hang on a minute. So this kid thought I was talking about Dwayne Johnson okay. and not Boris Johnson. And there's this moment where the kid realizes and we all laugh and then he laughs. And that was on TV, went viral, was in like newspapers, oh, it was in the Independent. Goodness. And then we did a Christmas special. This kid comes back, just the shoulders on him. He's like, remember Huge. me? Like yeah, that, yeah. that he just, and it was yeah. great. So awesome. it's, I love hanging out with kids. I just think they're funny and the, the, the lack of cynicism and yeah. the, the, just those little moments of like, just weird humor mm. I'm well into. I think they're so funny. Before we wrap up, I want, I want you to share with um, Devil and everyone listening, like what's your strengths? What do you see as your strong points in your character that has allowed you to reach the success that you've had um, as one of you know Britain's um, funniest, well loved. It's not just the funny alone; it's the support and the love that your supporters have for you as well. I think I'm quite. I, a, I love what I do. I really do. I really enjoy it. Um, I'm. I'm lucky. Um, I'm resilient, um, uh -huh. and I'm. I'm hardworking, and. I'm, uh, I've managed to sort of use fear to achieve. And I don't think that's necessarily a good thing, but- Oh, you? Mm, well, see, I, it makes you do stuff. Mm. But see, my thing with it is, so let's, re let's say you're getting ready for a big tour, okay. right? So fear is a huge motivator because like, listen, if you don't write new jokes, you don't okay. think of new things, it's gonna be, it's gonna be shit, yeah. it's gonna be shit. So you live in six months of, it's gonna be shit, it's gonna be shit. In order to make you make greatness, yeah. you have to put yourself in fear. Okay. So my thing being, you then get to the tour, the tour goes well, mm -hmm. and you go, whew, rather than enjoying it. Mm. So my thing now is I'm trying to figure out if there's a way of creating without being so hard on myself, mm -hmm. because otherwise I got six months of self-created turmoil of like, shit, 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 you better do this. Th so I can never enjoy any of it. And that seems mad. Oh, gotcha. So so that's a, a a recent evolution I'm trying to deal with. It's quite nuanced, but yeah. do you see what I mean yeah, by it? It's totally. like, because fear, there is nothing that motivates like fear. It's like nothing bad thing, so sense. I have to figure out a way so bad thing doesn't okay. happen. But sometimes, you make the bad thing so bad mm. that you just can't get out of it because your your brain is always like shit, it's fucking awful rubbish, never going anywhere. I fucking hear you. So you're like going, okay, well, oops, sorry. Okay. So so what do I do? Yeah. So that's that's the thing I'm trying to get better at. That's so beautiful. I'm trying to be more knowing, being aware, self awareness. Yeah, yeah, yeah what yeah. I need to improve on because I was going to ask about weaknesses as well. Yeah. Because with our strengths. Uh, there's weaknesses that we have that it's really good to be aware of. Yeah, I've and so many weaknesses. You, you know, you're, <laughs> you're highlighting one of yours about the fear. So you can achieve success by utilizing fear, but what I'm hearing you saying is that along the journey, you're gonna have to deal with that fear and not keep using it because it's not gonna keep working for you. Yeah. At, throughout all stages. Of, of your growth for the rest of your life you it's know. not going to work is it no because then that's not it's mm. it's not a pleasant life for mm. you it's not the best life for people around you yeah if you're self-creating fear when mm. you go it's not it's going to be fine oh don't say that because what if it's not mm. yeah but it always is <laughs> so yeah. maybe it always will be yeah because you work hard enough but you don't have you don't have to self-lacerate all the time 100 percent. you know but, 100%. but in terms of like weaknesses, in, you know, I've got like, um, it, you know, instead of uh, doing, I, I do too long on stage a lot. And sometimes just kind of just 
kind of punch people out. That's definitely a weakness where you kind of go, right, we've done two hours now and you're only meant to do 40 minutes and hey, probably not going to be great from now okay, on. We, we it, share the same thing. Yeah. My wife's always going like this to me. Well, it's because you just get so desperate. The thing is, <laughs> I, I think, see, my thing is, I think we're quite similar in this. Yeah. In that because you are drawn to prosaic language as well, mm -hmm. I can sort of sense it in you. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm willing to guess you don't write that down. I think what you do, because it's certainly what I do, mm. is I chase it. Mm. So, so I'm constantly talking yeah. until I find the way I want to say it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So as a consequence, our respective wives are like, you fucking said that five minutes ago, but we're going, yeah, but I'm trying to say it in the best way. So do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, but we're not having a yeah. conversation. Yeah. We're just going, what is it I want to say? <laughs> like, and that is, that's a, that's, a strength and a weakness yeah. because it's just like stop fucking talking man you're like oh, man. Yeah, i'm not we wish you point out your yeah. missus is off camera yeah. making all kinds <laughs> of gestures she's having to walk away doing that i haven't seen a woman laugh like that since we're my jeans backwards <laughs> but um but that's a definite yeah. it's, it's a strength and a weakness just because you know i don't prepare anything no i sense that but, yeah but and i don't mean it in a bad way yeah. i mean that in, that's why it's a genuine conversation okay but it's I, I like bullet points or se self-obsession yeah. is definitely a weakness as in the, the, in terms of the art of comedy yeah. and kind of go, right, it's got to be this, got to be that. And sometimes there's things that are more important mm. that, that, you know, sort of relationships yeah. and, and um, you know, life mm. and putting too much into oh, yeah. uh, kind of comedy, into your work and not putting enough into kind of relationships is quite, you know, that's a, that's a definite word. Are you, are you funny with your missus? Do you find I think her so. laughing? I think I'm very funny, yeah. Is, is, she, is she a big fan? She, yeah, but she's also... So when, when she sees me on tour, she's seen every single bit of it. Because I'm of the master of like slipping a bit in. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Of like, so, so it's just that terrible, oh, that sounded 100%. bad. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but, which Sounds is, like yeah, me yeah. having a chat with my yeah, exactly. missus in your uh, windows. Exactly, it wasn't slipping a bit in that film you watched as kids. <laughs> but um, but it's it's that thing where, uh, uh, so our finger saying, so like, that, let's say that Peter Crouch thing, the yeah. dog thing I was chatting about earlier. Yeah. So she's like, oh, how was your day? You go, oh, I just sit in the park. Like that, and then she has, and then, but my wife's so uh, aware now that she's sort of looking at me and going, <laughs> it's not the first time you said that, isn't it? Because I've been on the phone to my mate, I've okay. been in the park. So, yeah. Okay, so but, she clocks it, she knows what's going on. Everyone who is, uh, goes out with a comedian or is married to a comedian yeah. is, is familiar with that. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it, it's just that, yeah, I, I do make her laugh and we do have a laugh. But sometimes she's like, is this stuff? Is this stuff you're going to stay on stage? You're like, it may be. You know, it might be. You know sometimes you got funny things. Like you know, so it's, and, and obviously sometimes it's shit. Yeah. You know, and it's just, you're chasing a thought or you're trying to find mm. a thing. And because I'm obsessed with my work, um, I kind of rabbit on in mm. a way that my, my, uh, my wife is a doctor. And, um, you know, doesn't feel... I should be asking you what that's like being dating a doctor then. Yeah, it's because incredible. I was going to say, what's that like for her yeah, being a comedian, yeah. but she's just as busy as a doctor. But yeah, well, exactly. And, and you know, weirdly, they're very similar jobs. It, from a mental point of view, yeah. like you see her and you see her friends and doctors have that ability. They can look at somebody and go, okay, what's the information I need? They go into their brain, mm. you just literally see them pull out and go, okay, they need that, that, mm. that, mm. that, and I'll do that. And comedians are very similar, only they're accessing mm. utterly mm. pointless shit. But there's just so much stuff up there's there so that you can kind of go, oh, this is a thing. Mm. Oh, you've got a dog. Oh, I'll tell you a thing about a dog. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's sort of, but the brains are quite similar. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's a lot of doctors that are, have become comedians. But, um, Interesting. But she, yeah, it's great, particularly with the last two years, the sort yeah. of the pandemic and that, you sort of, it, you sort but you feel you're administering medicine also to people. Yeah, but it's... Laughter is medicine. Laughter is medicine, but... Come it, on, come on, Russell. I can't say that. Come on, Dr. Yeah, Russ. Dr. Russ. <laughs> 
Dr. Russ sounds like... like That's dope. It's just, You're going to yeah. try it on the missus tonight oh, yeah, when yeah. you get in. Dr. Russ is yeah. in the oh, house. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Russ is in the house, yeah. But it's that... It's, I sound like a capital O FM DJ. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dr. Russ. Um, um, that's the, that is the that's the ghost of Christmas. Someone's future. gonna take that. Well, I mean, no, I just, yeah, I'm just I'm gonna end up as a yeah. DJ. I know it. Okay. Anyways, but the point I'm making, it's okay. like it's a really, it, it's it's, I think what doctors have is they, the, and what you have if you're kind of married to someone is mm. just that that is a that is a true calling, like and they mm. you are either you're born for that or you're yeah. not. But but also it's like you say going in so having someone like my wife having a doctor go in and talk to kids yeah. you know the, the kind of kids that you're talking to That's they, it. but they've probably seen real trauma real and, and you know like actually, does she come in and talk about it to you i think no she does very occasionally yeah but what she does is she'll very often talk to her colleagues about it okay because it's a way of yeah you know what i mean it's that's, don't you go in and say what happened today yeah, but sometimes it's it's the, very often it's not her story to tell. I see. And so it's that thing that is the the doctor patient confidentiality. I see. Thing that that so okay, she, yeah, and she yeah. takes that really seriously. No, of course. So it, and it's sort well, of. I got to take it seriously with my life coaching. Totally, yeah. it's exactly the same. It's yeah. not the ex, that's the thing. Yeah. It's not your it's not your story to tell. Yeah, that's it. You know, and yeah. and so that's the thing. But the point I'm making. The, the, the brain that she has, she probably could have been in the city, she probably could have made, you know, millions from that, mm. but her thing is she wants to make people better and protect and look nice. after people, and that is clearly what mm. gives her all, the, 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 all those dopamine hits. Nice. That, that Save purpose. Lives. But it's sort of that, it's a big thing that I found during the pandemic. I, I read a thing somewhere, I can't remember, but just about how important purpose was. And, and when, but when we had those kind of oceans of hours of yeah. just sort of sat with ourselves and the inertia of it and the stillness of it and, and not that you, I, I found it was like, I've got to find something that I'm aiming towards. And my mm. thing was gigs. And my wife has that every day. A doctor has that where you're like, my purpose is to make them better no every doubt. single day. And, it, no and it, it never goes away. And you either have that or you don't. No, you don't, innit? So how did it affect business? How did it affect your career? Just the whole, you know, the whole um, well, pandemic. Basically, I was I was super lucky. I kind of got to do a I did a TV show um, f from from my bedroom, and nice. the money went towards the NHS trust or and thing called the Trussell Trust, which is like Brilliant. like um, it's a food bank charity, really mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah, um, and then. Um, I just I was super lucky that you know I've done all right in life, so yeah, I didn't so I didn't have to work, uh -huh. you know. And there's a lot of young comics, mm. young musicians, yep. directors, yep. Yep. whatever, yep. creatives, yep. well not even just creatives, that suddenly it's like, how am I going to make money out of my oh. passion? Yes. And I was lucky enough that I can kind of so I put my energy into right. There'll be a time when I'm able to do gigs again. Mm. So I did gigs outside and in woods and in car parks and wherever it may be. Okay. And then eventually, you would perform in comedy clubs and they were half full. And then they were wearing masks. And then they were all together. And then the crowds were big. And then everyone was together. And it feels like now, touch wood, mm. that's kind of where we're at. Hopefully, mm. for the foreseeable, no where crowds are crowds. And comics are coming out. Give me a shout, bro, when you're doing these little. Oh, totally, man. Yeah. These little gigs. Yeah, come along. And you're trying out. Some you were like, time, heard bro. it, Peter <laughs> Crouch, heard it. Um, no, do that. Yeah, yeah. But there's there's yeah. um there's an amazing gig um in in London called Top Secret Comedy. Okay. That, that a lot is a really great place mm. that um that people go down there. They've had everyone. Uh, Trevor Noah did it once. So it's a proper great gig. I'm on it. I Russ, really enjoyed that, mate. You Absolutely are the wonderful. man. I'm so happy that you came down here. Pleasure. This is another episode of the Dr. Prince Show with the lovable, genuine, the lovable. awesome <laughs> Russell Howard. Uh, make sure you tune in, subscribe, and share. I'll see you in the next episode. Take care, guys.